As she's coming, I want to thank all of the ladies that did an absolute wonderful job both in decorating and inviting. We had uh, county kitchen staff, about 43, 44 uh, folks at our ladies' banquet uh, Friday night, and about half of those were guests. And thank you ladies so much for inviting your friends, daughters, mothers uh, to come out and be a part of that. And uh, uh, y'all did a great job decorating. And during uh, the, the banquet, Kathy sang this song. And uh, it was just like the Holy Spirit moved into the place. Did y'all know the Holy Spirit can dwell in a gym? Amen. And uh, God just moved in that. And here's what I want to do. Kathy's going to sing this morning. If you know the words to the chorus, just sing it where you're at. You don't have to blow it out. But just, uh, just sing along with her on the chorus. And just take a moment, think about the words, and worship Him this morning, all right? I love you, Lord. For your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful and All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire In darkest night You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness of God. Cause all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will see of the goodness. God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me Your goodness is running after It's running after me Your goodness is running after It's running after me With my life laid down I surrender now I give you everything Your goodness is running after, running after me. Cause 
in our praise. But I, I want to submit to you today, he's worthy of our praise if he never does anything else for us. Amen? Uh, the fact that he sent his only son to die on an old rugged cross to save me from my sins, that's enough to praise him for today. And uh, I'm so thankful for that song. I appreciate uh, the spirit that God is moving in today. And Lord, I pray that you will just help us today. Amen? Uh, turn your Bibles this morning to 2 Timothy chapter number 1. 2 Timothy chapter number 1. We're going to read just one verse, uh, verse number 5. I hate to say this. I'm going to try to be quick today, all right? Uh, famous last words of a preacher. Uh, we're not going to have children's church today if you haven't picked up on that. We're going to let everybody stay out here for just a few moments. But in 2 Timothy chapter number one, uh, verse number five says this, when I call to remembrance the unfeigning faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, I am persuaded that in thee also. Paul is writing to Timothy and he is admonishing him and why he has called him into the ministry, why he has picked him to help him and to be a mentor to Timothy. And he says, I have called to remembrance. If we break this down, uh, we, we say Paul is looking into Timothy's life and he's basically reviewing what he thinks about Timothy. And he says, the unfeigning faith that is in thee. The word unfeigning means sincere real, not a counterfeit. Paul is saying to Timothy, Timothy, you're the real deal. How many of you today likes authenticity? Really? Come on, y'all. Y'all like the real thing. Y'all remember when Coke put out the thing, the real thing? We want to, the, the, a person to be real. We don't, I don't like people that put on shows. Paul looked at Timothy and said, man, you're the real thing. But notice where it came from. He said, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice. He said, I am persuaded also in you. Also in you. Brother Kevin, if you will, uh, stand and pray for us this morning that God will bless in the few minutes that we spend together today.
Amen. Thank you so much. If I could, let me paint the picture of what is taking place. And remember, I said way back at the beginning, fellas, don't turn me off. This is for everybody today, okay? And uh, Paul is uh, one Timothy to the Lord, probably from all indications, on his first missionary journey. And so this is the second missionary journey that he's going back through the area there and has tabbed Timothy as a student that he wants to train and make him a disciple just like Paul is. And he is uh, admonishing him on why he's picked him, and it basically goes back to grandma and mama. And we look at that and we say, okay, they did a great job. But what we don't understand about his mother, was it Lois? Lois was the mother, yes. She raised him in a difficult situation. You see, I don't know if y'all are like me, but a lot of times when, uh, boy, and I remember this well, when God called me to preach, I used every excuse I could come up with. You don't understand God, and I gave him a, a, a list of reasons why I could be a preacher. And they were valid points. But it didn't work. Mamas, daddies, everybody, we do not have an excuse on not raising up children of faith. Of not influencing others for the cause of Christ. Lois' his mother grew, uh, raised Timothy at a time where it wasn't good, it wasn't cool, it wasn't uh, beneficial to be a Christian. They... they we often say they were called Christians first in Antioch. That wasn't a term of endearment. It was a, a term that was not a good term. And they were persecuted Christians like crazy, even more than we can imagine even today. Lois, we'll, we'll learn later, was a um, not a single mom, but she raised Timothy on her own. We learned that Timothy's dad was a Greek. He was not saved. And so if they went to church, Lois took Timothy to church, and obviously church is different now than it is, or then than it is now. So there were obstacles in Lois' life, but she still raised Timothy in the faith. Mamas, daddies, dear Christians today, we do not have an excuse. You see, Lois, we learn, had a genuine faith. If you've got your bulletin on the back, it's an outline. If you'd like to Fill it in. Lois had a genuine faith. What did Paul call it? An unfeigning faith. We, we told you the definition. Sincere, real, not a counterfeit. Oh, how many of us today have a genuine faith? How do we, we see this? In A, you have to know it. It needs to be real in your life. You know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if you were to die today, you know you'd go to heaven. You must know your faith. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. It says, Wherefore, rather the brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. Dear friend, today, if we could, and I'm not going to ask you to do it, but maybe without closing your eyes, but uh, sometimes it's better to close your eyes and imagine. I wonder today if you could take me back to a time in your life where you know that the Holy Spirit was dealing with your life and you come to the realization that you are a sinner and you come to the realization that you needed Christ in your life. Can you visually in your mind see it? Do you remember it? If you have no recollection of that, we need to talk. Why? Because he said, make sure you know that your calling and election is sure. Because that is the foundation. Dear friend, today you need to know. Say this with me. I need to know. Eunice and Lois knew where their faith was. But not only do we need to know it, B, we need to grow it. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. This is logical stuff, isn't it? Know, number one, that you're saved. 
and then grow in your faith. I said this, I believe it was last week in the message. Uh, we, uh, growing up in the Super Duper Fundamental and Area Peace Literature Baptist Church, uh, I, it was people get saved, and it, it seemed like we failed them big time back then, and I don't want to do that now, we're working on this. But you were kind of uh, set out and said, okay, hope you make it. And everything you got, you got either in Sunday school, church, or some a revival, whatever. Other than that, they didn't put anything into you. How many of you would think it would be ridiculous to birth a baby into the world, hand them a bottle, and say, go get it? How long do you think that baby would last? Not long. Why? You've got to nurture that baby. When you get saved, you need nurturing and growing. If you're a young Christian today, you need to get with somebody that is a good Christian that will take you under their wing and teach you and guide you. That's what Paul did to Timothy. It needs to be nurtured. If you have a, uh, an issue with that, you need it, hey, get with me. We're, we're working on a discipleship program. I'm meeting with two people during the week now and uh, fix to start meeting with four more on Sunday night or whenever we can get together on that. Uh, you need to grow. Then see, show it, show it. Verse 18 of James chapter 2 says, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. I was in a, uh, a real estate transaction. I do real estate also. And... Uh, the guy that was the seller uh, was acting goofy. He was not doing what he was supposed to do. And, uh, and every time the, the transaction would come up, he would throw into my face, well, I don't believe God is leading me this way. And he kept using God as an excuse. So much so that the, the, the buyer, he was doing it to him too. And the buyer was lost as a goose. Lost as could be. And he would uh, uh, tell that buyer the same thing. Oh, and that guy told me, he said, you know what the buyer did? He said, that guy claims to be a Christian, but he's having to tell me all the time. He said, you know, if you've got to tell somebody, you're probably not a very good one. Amen, church? you got to show it. I heard a story of a little, a little boy, he came home from church one Sunday, and he looked confused, and his mama said, son, what's wrong with you? He said, well, something don't make sense to me, mama. He said, the, the teacher told us today that Jesus lives within us. Is that right? Yes, son, that's right. And we get saved, he, he dwells in us. She, he said, but mama, that teacher also told me that God is so big that he holds the whole world in his hand. Is that right, mama? Yep, that's right. He said, but she also told us that Jesus and God are the same. Yep, that's right. He said, well, if that's the case, and he, he's so big that he can hold the world, and he lives inside of me, shouldn't he be busting out of me everywhere? Y'all get it? If you didn't get it, ask your neighbor, okay? In other words, if he's in us, he ought to be coming out of us. I've told y'all this, those of you that come here on a regular basis, I remember when I was young, trust me, that's been a few years ago, where you could spot a Christian because they look different. Isn't it hard to do that today? What's the problem? We need to be showing it. And here's the thing. Children are great imitators. Yeah, they are too. Children are great imitators. Give them something good to imitate. Let me ask you a question today. If your child or somebody you have influence on imitates you, what would we see? What would we see? Secondly, she taught the scriptures early. 
Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, verse 15. She taught the Scriptures early. But continue thou in all things which thou hast learned, this is Paul talking again, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. We know that was Eunice and Lois. Verse 15, And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ. What was Paul saying to Timothy? I know that mama and grandma put some scripture in you early on. Now, we, uh, uh, in Awana on Sunday nights, we just finished it up for the year. We'll start back up in September. And uh, one of the things that Awana is known for is scripture memorization. And I... As the pastor, I failed in this. We should have been emphasizing this even more. Uh, Lincoln, where's Lincoln at today? Is he sick? Yeah. I'm so sorry. Lincoln, one of our little guys that sits up here, uh, uh, he took it upon himself. He learned a lot of verses. I, Hannah, what, Hannah uh, do you know how many he learned? Lord, I asked the one that can't talk this morning. <laughs> Lord, help me. A bunch. We'll go there. Do you know Miss Sheila? Okay. He got the award for learning the most verses. And y'all know how it is. You try to memorize verses, and if somebody come up to you and say, quote, so-and-so, you, uh, uh, I am. I mean, I can't remember my name half the time. But it's been amazing when I've been in a situation where I needed to recall a verse, the Holy Spirit plugs it in my ear and quotes it to me, and I can say, if any of y'all have experienced that, please tell me. All right, two people, good. rest of us, we're going to learn verses next week, okay? Learning verses is important. Getting the scripture in. Why? Because what goes in will come. That works both good and bad. Amen, church? He, she taught him the scriptures. You know, we spend so much time teaching everything other than what we should. Guilty. That's charged. I, especially when we lived in Coleman, uh, I used to live in Alabama, for those of you that don't know. I'm from here, went there. I tell people I was on the mission field to Alabama. Luckily, I already spoke the language, okay? I was country. And uh, football is a religion in Alabama. And I ain't joking. It is a religion. And every man over there thinks their little boy is going to be the next Patrick Mahomes or whoever. And I helped coach Little League, Justin played, and I had more problems with the parents than I had with the kids thinking little Leroy needs to be the one running the ball all the time. But do you realize they spent all kinds of money, we spent all kinds of money on everything to promote our young person, to promote our child, and to be an influence to them, and less than 1.5 Athletes actually make it to college to play college ball. And there's a whole lot. That's all levels. Of those that make it to college, point two make it to the pros. In other words, a very, 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 can I say very again, small number. That's statistics. Let me give you another statistic. One hundred percent of us are going to stand before the judgment. We're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, or we're going to stand at the great white throne judgment. One or the other. Mamas, daddies, people of influence, let me ask you. Them children, them people that are around you, I, I told y'all last week, I would hate to stand before God and some of my family members say, Why? Didn't you tell me? I want them to know who Jesus is. The Bible tells in Psalm chapter 78, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open up my mouth in a parable, and I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children. Show to the generation to come praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He has done. 
For he established the testimony of Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should be make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who shall raise and declare them unto their, their children, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. What was the psalmist saying? Mama, Daddy, passed it down. I, I say things sometimes that comes out of my mouth, and if my kids been around Dad very often, they probably heard things come out of my mouth. They go, huh, that sounds like Papa. I, I catch myself saying things that my dad used to say. Arlene, me, and, and David got a lot of the sayings from my dad. We repeat them. A lot of the things that I do, now I'm a lot bigger man than my dad was physically, and but I catch myself doing things that I remember seeing him do. Why? Because it's passed down. You ladies that ate the food Friday night, that was a direct influence of my mom. Mom could take nothing. I mean, she'd open the pantry and say, we ain't got nothing to eat. In about 15 minutes, we'd have a full meal on the table. I don't know how she did it. But I learned that from mom. It was passed down. Let me ask you a question. What are you passing down to those around you? How important is it to get it into these young people? You say, well, and I've had this told me, and I'm sorry. I know I ain't supposed to get mad, but I get mad about it. I want to let my kids make up their own mind. Have you ever heard that? We have a, there's a Greek word for that called baloney. That may be French, I don't know. That's nonsense. Do you make them brush their teeth? Absolutely. Why? You don't want your teeth to rot out. Do you make them go to school? Sure. You hope they learn something so they can make something out of themselves. You make them take a bath? I hope so. Or if not, they're going to stink. Make them go to church. Make them get involved. Why? Because they don't have good sense. There was a guy who did a test. He laid down, seemed like it was $1,000, $2,000 stacked up. And he laid five Oreo cookies out beside of it. And he asked a six-year-old to make a choice. Y'all know what the six-year-old picked? I would have too, really. I don't know. I like Oreos better than like. No, I don't, really. I, you can buy a whole lot of Oreos for $1,000, can't you? But they don't make good decisions. Put it in their life. Why is it important to reach them young? Because you get a young person and you mold them and develop them all the way up. You build a great foundation under them. And let me prove this to you. We've got a movement going on now, and I don't know how in the world they're getting away with it. Uh, but who are the, the homosexual crowd going after? What's happening in our schools today? Why mess with the young people? Because they know if they get it in it to them young, they'll accept it when they get older. Don't get quiet on me. Somebody say amen. you got to get them young. Here's a good testimony to how well you're raising your children and how well you did. You'll see it when they start raising theirs. I'm sure my... <laughs> I can't get into a lot of the stories, but... My dad chuckled at some of the ways I disciplined my kids. I made them carry water one time. We won't get into all that. He thought that was kind of funny because that's something he would have done. Mom and dad kind of got a kick out of the way me and my sisters raised our kids. That's how you know when you did a good job. Then lastly, y'all, I think I'm going to make it for 12 o'clock. Isn't that amazing? we got a hand clap of praise already. That's wonderful. <laughs> Make sure you get somebody to do it with you, man. You, you stand out when you do that. <laughs> Lastly, she prioritized faithfulness. She prioritized faithfulness. Acts 16, 
Verse 1. Then came he to Derby and to Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, which is who we're talking about, the son of a certain woman, which was Jewish, and believed, but his father was a Greek. This is talking about the, the separation in the home, which was re- well reported of by the brethren that were in Lystra and Iconium. Paul is writing here in Acts, and he is uh, emphasizing that a young man, he said, has been spoken well of. Why? Because he had a good mama. Why? Because he had good influences in his life. And it was reported that he was a good young man by those around him. What were they saying about Timothy? You know what? When, When we need Timothy, he's available. He's faithful. He does what he says he'll do when he says he'll do it. Timothy was faithful. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, guess I'm going to pick on you for a minute. Lord help, I may not ever get you to come back. I don't know. Faithfulness is important. Am I right? We jokingly, at Easter and Christmas, we have that crowd, and that's the two times of the year they go to church. We call them Christers. Christmas and Easter, y'all get it? They only come to church twice a year. Some of you may have come today and this is the only time you've been in a long time. Church doesn't make you a good Christian, but it sure will help. Being around God's people, what did the verse say? Exhorting one another, encouraging one another, helping one another grow. That's what it's all about. I don't come to church. Well, I have to because I'm the pastor, but I get that, but... Y'all help me. When I look out in this crowd and I see you, and I know every one of you that's here, I see you. You help me just by being here. Your faithfulness encourages your pastor. What are you faithful to? Everybody's faithful to something. How many of you got a job? Some of y'all need to get a job, y'all. Come on. They were about 10 people. How many we got here? 60? 10 people out of 60 has a job. Lord, help us. Are you faithful to your job? You know why are you faithful to it? How many of you like a paycheck on Friday? 20 people raised their hands. That's amazing. I need to work wherever y'all other 10 ain't work, are working at. We like paychecks. That's why we're faithful. And here's the sad thing, and, uh, and hey, some places it ain't beneficial to go to church. Some places it's a, a, a social club. I hate to admit this, but some places it's a gripe and a groan. I'm glad I get to go to church where we can laugh every now and again. We can learn something, I hope, on quite often. We can love on each other. I have never been around a group of people that love on each other like this group right here. And I am not saying that just because I'm up here. And most of the people that come, especially for the first time, they say, man, we got treated well. We love it. Matter of fact, there's a family that came two weeks ago, and they loved the church and wanted to be back so bad. And the husband had a health issue. We're going to pray for him. And every time I go to see him, oh, we wish we could come back to church because everybody treated us Look, you come. We're going to love on you. One old preacher said, we'll treat you so many different ways, you got to like one of them. That's the way we'll do it. Can I encourage you today to be faithful? And here's the true, boy, if there's never been a truer saying, this is it. What you do in moderation, your children will do in excess. What you do in moderation... Your children and those you influence will do in excess. 
Here's the heartbreaking thing to me, and I've dealt with this for years. I've been in ministry a long time now, since 93. 94, I'm sorry. Since 94. That's 30 years, isn't it? Ooh, Lord have mercy. No wonder I ain't got no hair, y'all. Um, and I have dealt with many and many families. I've sat in the office, and mom and dad have brought teenager and young adult in, and, oh, preacher, help us. He's in this, and she's in that, and, and their life has been absolutely turned upside down. And I want to help them, and I want to encourage them, and I give them everything i got. But then I remember back, way back when them guys were that big, they were faithful to the ball field. They were faithful to cheerleading. They were faithful to everything but church. As a matter of fact, if we got them once a month, it was an amazing thing. And they would come in once a month thinking, hey, we here. Pat us on the back. Be faithful because this is the place you're going to get help to make it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday and when they turn 16. And how many mamas and daddies know when they turn 16, you need Jesus in their life? Yeah, we can. Y'all get women today. I appreciate that. It's faithfulness. It's important. Let me ask you a question this morning and we'll close. Are you faithful to lead and guide your children in God's Word? Living it in front of them. I told Kevin, and it's my fault, and, and, and it's going to be my leadership. Uh, next year, Awana, it has to be heavy, 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 heavy on Scripture memorization. Uh, there's a principle in leadership. What you celebrate is what you get. Guess what we're going to do? Uh, you're going to see me jump and shout every time a kid learns a verse. I'm going to celebrate it like crazy because I want them to know that's what's important. Me and Kevin are going to do cheers, okay? Every time kids, yeah, that'll be worth coming to see, I promise you. How about it today, church? Are you influencing young people? Are you influencing those around us? I understand and know that in this world that we're living in, it's tough. But you can raise a child of faith. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I want to ask a very, very important question. I ask this every service. And I mean it as sincerely as I can. I want you to take me back to that place that I took you to earlier where you know beyond a shadow of a doubt you knelt, whether you was in the car, I mean, you could have been anywhere, but you know a time and a place where you ask Christ to come into your heart and into your life. You confess your sins and say, Lord, I want you to be Lord of my life, director of my life, and Lord, as best I know how, I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins and to save me. Can you do that? I wonder today, every Christian that knows beyond a shadow of a doubt, you could take me back to that place. Would you raise your hand this morning? Every Christian in the building, you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, you could take me to that place. Thank you. Now, there may be some in here, and I, I can't see everybody with all the hands raised. So I don't know who did and who didn't, but I would like to ask you the same thing. I will not embarrass you. I will not come to you. I promise you. But I would like to pray for you, and I won't call your name out if I know it. But I wonder if you'd say, Brother Chris, I'm not 100% sure. I have some doubt that if I were to die today, I'd go to heaven. Would you be courage enough, courageous enough to raise your hand? How about it? Anybody in the building? Say, Brother Chris, I am not sure. Anybody? All right. No one raised their hand, and that's okay. Maybe you, you fell into that category, but you didn't want to raise your hand. If you want to know, get with me after church. Just come up to me and say, Preacher, I'd like to talk to you about something. And I, I'll pull aside and we'll talk, okay? Please don't leave this property today. If you do not know. Lord, thank you today for your blessings to us. Thank you for everyone that's here today. Oh, what a crowd, and they have made my week. Lord.